Give thanks to God and call upon his name. Make known God's deeds among the peoples. Seek God's presence and God's strength. Let us worship our God, for God is faithful. to speak your praise, open our ears to hear your word, open our eyes to see you at work among us, and open our hearts to receive your love. For we pray in the name of the one 
who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading of Psalm 8. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth! You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants you have founded a bulk work because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. As we prepare for silent prayer, let us remember Brenda Sherman, Amelia Corey, the people of Miami, the people of Cuba, Daniel and Carolyn Montague, Lori Ayat, Nancy Keefe, Penny Putnam, Pastor Hazard, the family of Thomas Matthews, Tom Virgo and his family, Cindy D'Andrea, Judy Zuliani, Nicole Siriello, Jim and Joan Burke, Perry Green, Fred Paris, Glenn Wynn, Master Finn Daly, Kayla Daly, Daniela and Matteo Siriello, living with a rare blood disorder, and their parents and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children. All who are afflicted with and by the virus, all innocents caught up in the war. Let us pray. Creator God, we come to you and approach your throne of grace as creatures of your kingdom. We find in you the source of life, the fount of all blessings, the wellspring of goodness, which you offer for our sustenance and our nourishment, both physical and spiritual. Seeing in you, O God, the ground of our being, we seek your continuing comfort in your never-ending care for our lives, that we might live in the light of your beauty as we repose under the shadow of your wing. O Lord most loving, we acknowledge that we have not loved as you have taught us to love, and that we have not always reflected your willingness to forgive others their trespasses. We pray, O Lord of love, that you will not deal with us harshly, even as we pray for your correction of our lives. Teach us, O Lord, to live in such a way that others will see evidence that Jesus is alive today, directing us in a pilgrimage of peace and leading us in paths of righteousness so that we might exemplify what is truly worthy of your will for our creation. Lord of the universe, we are thankful that you have gathered us together in community, sharing your goodness and calling others to your side. Strengthen us, O God, as we endeavor to build a faithful congregation in this place, 
that we might be a light to all who are lost in despair or languishing in pain. Almighty One, we pray not only for ourselves and not just for others like us, but for all whom you love, knowing that each and every one of your children is created in the divine image. May the spirit of the carpenter of Nazareth, who labored his entire life for the good of others, flourish in our own lives as we expend righteous efforts in hastening the coming of your kingdom here on earth. May our works bear good fruit, worthy of Christ's sacrifice, given so freely and offered so nobly, even in the face of evil. May our lives reflect his beauty, and may our strivings be worthy of his heavenly grace, so freely offered to all so generously, that all might be transformed by adhering to his ideals and partaking of his perfection. For we pray in the name of your Son. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, starting at verse number 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on earth to be his people, his treasured possession. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to, his ancestors, to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. From the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations, and who repays in their own person those who reject him. He does not delay but repays in their own person those who reject him. Therefore, observe diligently the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that I am commanding you today. If you heed these ordinances by diligently observing them, the Lord your God will maintain with you the covenant loyalty that he swore to your ancestors. He will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your wine and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the issue of your flock in the land that he swore to your ancestors to give you. Here ends the morning scripture lesson.
One of my professors in grad school was born and grew up in Nazareth. Yes, that Nazareth. His family was Greek Orthodox, and I was privileged to be invited to his wedding ceremony. I don't know if any of you are familiar with weddings in Orthodox churches, but their practice is that during the ceremony, the bride and the groom are crowned with gold, for they are carrying on in the tradition of Adam and Eve, who are considered to be representatives of all humanity. And biblically speaking, humankind is the crown of all creation. So Professor Shahid was looking very proud that day, and his wife Mary was radiant, glowing, a picture of beauty and serenity. Indeed, for one day, they were king and queen. The idea of being in such a privileged position is no stranger to us Westerners either. But as Americans, we tend to be a little less formal, shall we say. Back in the 1950s, there was a television program during which the audience elected one of the contestants, Queen for a Day. I can't say that I ever watched the program, and somehow a TV show doesn't quite measure up to a wedding ceremony filled with ritual and splendor. But our culture certainly has had a fascination for royal privilege. After all, didn't some crooner was it Frank Sinatra, sing a pop standard, If I Ruled the World? And didn't some artists suggest that every one of us would be famous for at least 15 minutes? Or was it 15 seconds? Everybody, naturally enough, wants to be important somehow, in some way. Why did a previous generation relate to the comedian who exclaimed indignantly, I don't get no respect? Maybe it's because we think we're important, or should be. And we get frustrated when others don't recognize that importance and the privilege that it should bring. Not too long ago, I was approached and asked if I did any serious counseling in my pastoral work. My reply was that sometimes I get the impression that counseling is just about all that I do. There are so many people who don't have any real sense that they have been created, as the psalmist says, a little lower than the angels. Too many people have doubts as to who they are, where they stand, what they have to offer, what can be done, how to confront a difficult situation without letting it get the better of them. And I'll be the first to admit that I'm not perfect myself in that regard. Why do so many of us have these doubts, these questions about our self-worth? Maybe it's due to the lack of respect that we get from one another, or even due to the lack of respect we have for ourselves. In the everyday tangles of life in this world, we often forget the greatness and the privilege that we have as children of the Almighty. And so when Jesus preached, love thy neighbor as thyself, he made some rather important assumptions. Are we really all that sure about loving ourselves? How can we love those around us if we are not sure that God made the right decision in loving us in the first place. Surely, if Jesus of Nazareth tried to do anything, it was to defeat this sense of worthlessness, to change our perception of ourselves, to set things aright, not just between God and ourselves, but with and among ourselves. That, I think, is at least partially what lies behind his statement in John's Gospel when he said, I call you not servants, but I have called you friends. What a transformation that can make if you think about it. No more need we question whether we are worthy of God's redemptive love, because as brothers and sisters of Christ, we share in the same benefits that God gave to Jesus himself. Help for the present, 
support through prayer, love offered freely to all, and a promise of glory at the end of our days. No more need we question whether or not we are beloved of God. How much higher can we go? How much better can we be? How much closer to the ultimate can we get if we can speak of God in the most intimate of terms and if we can call Christ our friend? Would we trade being famous for 15 minutes or even 15 seconds? Would we trade being queen for a day or being the ruler of the world for being a friend of Jesus Christ? To be sure, that would not end all of our immediate problems in life. There are those who would have us doubt our worth, question our sincerity, undermine our confidence, shake our Christian resolve, and challenge our faith. But what are they and all their efforts in the face of the divine assurance from Christ that my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone pluck them out of my hand. To be sure, Christianity is not about resting on our privileges in Christ while Jesus does all the real work. A lot of people think that privilege means getting out of things they don't like or don't want to do. Many think that privilege is somehow the opposite of responsibility. But quite the contrary is the case. Privilege engenders responsibility. And that's what this community that we call the Colebrook Congregational Church is all about. For scripture puts it this way, to whom much has been given, from him much shall be required. The question is, have we been fulfilling our minimum daily requirement that privilege demands of us? It's so easy to think so little of ourselves and of our congregation that we cannot imagine the graciousness, the beauty that God can deliver through us to a world that so desperately needs more grace and more loveliness. We are all capable of so much good. We have all been the recipients of so much divine attention. We have all been loved so profoundly so selflessly, so compassionately. Well, now it is time to turn the tables. We have received so much that it is time to give in return. It is time to discover what a privilege it is to serve the one who has done so much for us. Amen.
May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen.